Welcome to Chapter 6 of the Research Methods class for uh, Science and Sports Management Fitness Technology students. Let me share the screen and we'll be going. All right, so Chapter 6, Experimental Research. So, Experimental research, we're looking for a cause and effect relationship where we're looking for the underlying mechanisms of how something works, right? So again, if we're trying to figure out, um, you know, how diets work, right? So we could look at the different diets that are out there. We could look at ketogenic, vegan diet, you know, uh, vegetarian, we could look at normal Western diet, Mediterranean diet and try to figure out, well, okay, how do these diets work? How, you know, um, if people are on these different diets, do we see a cause and effect, all right? So we could put them all on the same calories and, and see if there's any differences that happen between those diets, right? So one diet help with your blood lipid profiles. Does one diet help more with weight loss? Um, spoiler alert on that, if they're all at the same calories, you're not gonna see. Uh, any difference really um, in those. But again, we're trying to see if there's a cause and effect, right? Um, different lifting routines, right? If we fit them all against each other to see does one cause you to get stronger versus one cause you to get bigger, one makes you more explosive, so on and so forth, right? So the independent variable is the cause and the cause and effect relationship. So this is the one we're playing with, right? So again, when I was talking about the diets, we would put everybody on different diets. If we were talking about exercise, we would put we would do different exercise protocols, right? So those would be your independent variables. Um, we also call it the experimental treatment, right? And this is the one that we manipulate or the one that we play with or, or the one that we control and mess with to see what happens. Okay. Your dependent variable is the effect, right? So if I put you on a diet and you lose weight. The weight would be what we measure. So what happens in your body with um, the reduction in fat percentage would be the effect, right? Um, so it's what we measure, okay? So this is what we expect to see change. Um, and again, it doesn't always happen that you'll see change when, when we do experiments, but this is what we expect to see change, okay? So cause-effect relationships. There's a strong correlation between the cause and the effect. The cause precedes the effect, right? Um, so the cause always produces the effect in the absence of some other simultaneously acting factor intervening. So for example, say if we wanted to see if creatine alone makes you build muscle. As nothing, to, you know, we'll, we'll just say it has nothing to do with lifting weights or anything like that. So we would take folks that are currently not lifting any weights or, or doing anything. We put them on creatine and we see if just creatine um, and again, creatine don't just build muscle, but we just put you on creatine and see what happens. Now, one of the problems is, is we may have, you know, when we tell people, hey, go, go about your normal life. Well, somebody that was previously not working out for some reason during the experiment decides they're on creatine, they're like, oh, I wonder how this will work with working out. So then they start working out and then we see that, you know, we have, this one subject that was just taking creatine and all of a sudden he put on a lot of muscle or she put on a lot of muscle and everybody else didn't, right? And we're like, huh, well, it worked in this person, right? Well, no, they were exercising along with that, right? But again, what you wanna do is control for as much as you can so that hopefully whatever you're, you're manipulating or changing is the acting factor that is going to cause any of the changes that you'll measure, okay? Um, and that, again, there's no viable alternative explanation for the effects, right? So again, one of the things you, you know, because when we do a lot of experiments, we don't have somebody come and live in a little laboratory. We don't feed them other foods and control every um, aspect of their day. 
you know, again, we'll ask them, hey, whatever you're doing now, please continue to do that same thing. Don't change, you know, don't add any new things to your diet, don't add any new things to your, your exercise um, repertoire throughout the time you're doing that experiment. Don't, you know, maybe don't go on vacation or do something out of the ordinary, right? Try to keep a routine to the best of your ability um, so that what we see is the actual effect of whatever treatment we're giving you, right? And as long as they adhere to that, then that's what you should see, okay? Experimental control, ensuring that the testing conditions are exactly the same for all participants, right? So you want to try to get rid of any extraneous variables, the variables other than the independent variables that can exert an effect on those groups of independent variables. So, Again, one of the problems is, is sometimes when we do uh, experiments that involve supplementation, right? Sometimes when you give people supplements, where you give people even a placebo, um, you know, and they don't know that they have a good think they're on supplements, sometimes they try to up their game, right? So, you know, you're like, oh, we need people that work out for about an hour a day. And so we have all these folks that volunteer and they come in, they're like, yeah, I work out for about an hour a day. Well, now that they're on a supplement, sometimes they get a little bit, you know, more enthusiastic about their exercise. So maybe they still work out for an hour a day, but now because of this, they think they're on something, they're giving more effort throughout that hour of the day. Or maybe they go for about an hour and a half, you know, or, you know, those are some things that can become extraneous variables, right? And so then you want to control for those things. So give explicit instructions you know, that, hey, we're just looking at a supplement with your normal exercise routine doesn't, now again, maybe part of the supplement is it does give you more energy, right? So, you know, hopefully that's what we see, you know, that, okay, they come in and they're giving you more effort during the exercise and then, okay, right? So, um, you know, it just depends on what you want to control for. Um, you know, other things are, it's, if you have somebody do a pretest, you know, say you have them do a pretest at eight o'clock in the morning, so they're kind of sleepy people at eight o'clock in the morning. We don't want to do the post test or any mid test, maybe in the afternoon when they're more awake, because again, that can also lead to some extraneous variables that, hey, eight o'clock in the morning, they're always kind of groggy, their eyes are shut. Um, we want them coming in under as close to the same conditions every time we test them, right? so that we can ensure that the data is not contaminated by anything that's extraneous, right? Uh, there's different forms of validity that we'll talk about in here. So validity is your ability, or is the ability of a research study to faithfully reflect the true state of the variable being studied in the population of interest. So when we have internal validity, Stability to conclude that only the independent variables affected any difference in measures of the dependent variables across the groups or across the tests on the same group. So again, this includes that you have um, the researchers that are involved when they're, especially when they're interacting with the uh, participants, they all interact exactly the same, they give the exact same instructions, um, they you know, if they use the same measurement techniques. So we're not measuring body fat with the BIA on one person, DEX on another person, calipers on another person. Um, we don't have some folks that are hurrying them through the tests and other folks are like, sure, take your time. Those type of things we want it. We want to make sure that whatever the experiments are, so you've got maybe several groups that are getting different supplements, one group's getting a placebo or you're doing different exercise protocols or things like that, that they're all getting the same attention to detail, right? External validity is the ability to generalize the results of the study to the sample population, real world setting. So how does that work? It depends on who you're doing the experiment on, right? So again, if we're doing an experiment on, um, you know, say down here uh, in South Florida, um, you know, say I'm in Miami, and all the folks that come in to participate are 18 to 25 year old um, Latin males um, that work out, right? And I do some experiment with them on some type of supplement and everything. And everything. I really can't um, put that out to the population. I can't, one, I can't say that this works for both men and women. I 
can't say this works across all races and ethnicities. Um, I can't say that this works for all ages. Um, and I can't say this works for both people that work out and don't work out, right? Um, it, it's really specific to that group. So again, how do we, you know, if we want to generalize this out to more people, we need a larger sample size one. Um, you may need a, you know, again, if you want to say that this works for all types of folks within the U.S., we may want to run these experiments through different regions of the U.S., again, for men and women, of all ethnicities of, you know, reflecting as many age groups as possible, those that work out, those that don't work out, gives you more external validity to greater population. Or you just say, look, this is my population, you know, I'm looking at um, young African American males between 18 to 35, and I want to see if this supplement has this effect with them. Okay, and that's okay too, right? Um, but again, when you, when you generalize it out during the conclusion and the results and everything, that's how you have to generalize it out, right? So internal validity, um, you want to conclude that only the independent variables affected any difference in measure in the dependent variable. Eliminate any plausible rival hypotheses, proposals that something other than the independent variable affected dependent. So I see this a lot in, um, when I see folks do some of the diet research. And again, I, I don't see this with um, people that do good diet research, but I've seen, you know, um, there, there's one that I used in the last class, uh, or last time I taught this class, and we found a, an article that we were looking at. And it was looking at a low fat diet versus a ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet's results were very superior, right? And so, you know, knowing what I know about weight loss, you know, as a weight loss study, is that I'm like, there shouldn't be any difference if the calories are the same. So I looked through the study, and what I found was that in that particular um, article was that the researchers um, controlled the calories for those in the keto group. So they made sure that they stayed, like, at, I can't remember what it was like, um, 1,500 calories or less, 1,200 calories or less. The low fat diet group, the way they did it was is all they did is um, those folks reported that they were only getting 10% um, of their total calories or 15% or something like that. Um, from fat and all the rest of their percentage of calories were from um, carbs and protein, okay? But they also mentioned they didn't control for their calories, right? That they allowed them to eat, um, as long as their percentages, they actually didn't control for their calories. Now, my first thing is, looking at that, is I was like, this is a very poor study because my, my plausible rival hypothesis for that study would be you know, the lower calorie diet is going to be superior in weight loss than the highly higher calorie diet, regardless of whether it's low carbs or low fat, right? And they didn't control it by any means. They, they actually, to me, look like research bias in trying to make the ketogenic diet more superior than the low fat diet, right? Um, and so really, really bad internal validity. Okay. Um, again, I've you know studies that have been done on um, males. Um, you know, especially a lot of the studies that were done for years and years and years were always done on, on young white males because they're the least um, compromised population um, in a lot of different regards. Um, you know, and they used to take these studies and try to generalize them out to everyone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah this type of exercise works well for women. This type of uh, a dietary supplement works well for you know African American males, Latin males, or Asian males, and it really if you want to know how things work across all groups. Now again, a lot of times there's you know there's a lot of things that we all hold true when it comes to physiological uh, things in our body. Um, you know, regardless of you know of uh, race or ethnicity, and then again there's certain things that are different, certain things that are the same when it comes to gender, so on and so forth. But you can't generalize it out that way, okay? Um, now you can say we saw this in this this group, and we theorized that we would see this in all races and all you know in, in all genders based on what we know physiologically. But 
um, you can't really say that it works for all those groups until those studies are done, right? And so again, um, right now, I see a lot of research that, um, I don't wanna say it's been done in the past because it is different. You know, some of the, the, the research that was done, you know, back in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, that were always done on white males are now being done on females, being done on those of different ethnicities and so on and so forth. Um, and, and again, we're seeing, you know, the results we expect to see, but again, it just can, confirms the theories, right? It just confirms those theories. And so it adds to the external validity of the previous research, which was done on young white males, you know, and then doing them on those of, of um, greater ages too, you know, um, going from above them, you know, above the 35 year old range and so on and so on, right? Okay. Um, so to promote external validity, the sample or participants select for the study should be representative of the population, right? So again, um, if, I wanted, if I want this to be both men and women, I need to have a good representation of both men and women, right? If I want it to just be young males, then it's young males. If I want it to be older females, then it's older females. But again, the, the population, um, the sample of that population needs to represent that. Inclusion criteria. These are characteristics individuals must possess to qualify as participants. Um, and it needs to be appropriate. So again, if I'm doing an experiment on minor league baseball pitchers, right, and, and looking at something, then the you know all my all the people that are going to participate are going to be those that are employed in the minor leagues as pitchers, right? I'm not going to include collegiate pitchers. I'm not going to include high school shortstops, so on and so forth, right? It, it needs to represent that group, okay? And again, exclusion criteria would be those that they must not possess. So again, I'm not gonna take major league, you know, if, if these guys are in the major league, then, you know, even if they're pitchers and they were previously in the minor league, well, they're now in the major league, so that excludes them, right? Again, if they're collegiate pitchers, that excludes them. If they're former minor league, you know, not current, and I'm looking at current, that would exclude them, okay? If they're softball pitchers, that exclude them, basketball players, so on and so forth, you get the idea, right? They don't fit the grouping. Um, ecological validity, the extent to which the testing conditions in a study are like the conditions in the environment being studied. So again, I live in South Florida. It's hard for me to do a good altitude study down here in South Florida if I want to look at the um, you know, how people perform in high altitudes, right? Um, now, if I want to do, uh, you know, how people perform in humidity in hot, humid conditions, you know, we'll run the study here in July and see how that goes. But again, you know, it, it, it needs to be representative of that. Now, again, we can manipulate some of those things in some labs. You know, we have labs where we can change the barometric pressures. We have labs where we can change the, the heat humidity in those and, and things like that. Um, but again, you know, if you're going to do those things, we can't extrapolate from here that, you know, if I have somebody do a cardiovascular training method down here, that I can say, hey, you know, we're going to see the same thing at a high altitude, right? It's not going to work. Um, threats to internal validity, history is something occurring over time other than experimental treatment that can affect the dependent variables. Um, so, you know, the, this could be, um, you know, something that's going on out, you know, like, again, your subjects are coming in and out. Um, so something could be happening with them during that time. Maybe they're having health issues or things like that. Um, maturation, effects related to the passage of time, such as aging. Um, again, you know, if you're looking at, you know, does this help? You know, say you're doing a longitudinal study with someone, <laughs> and you're looking, okay, is this something that makes you actually more physically, uh, you know, it increases your physical capabilities in something, but during that time, the person ages from 25 to 55, you're going to see, you should see an actual decline, you know, the, you know at a certain time. So again, you know, if you ran that experiment for three months during the time they were 25 or six months during the time they were 25 would be one thing, 
the, you know, during this longitudinal study, their body is peaked and now it's dropping down, you know, that could be something, um, you know, or um, testing, right? So again, if you run the same test over and over, um, say some part of the test is the reason people don't do well during the pretest is they don't know how the test works, right? So they do it. They kind of learn it, so then the second time they do it, because they've done it before, they're now familiar, they know the test is going to, you know, maybe it follows a certain pattern. They start to learn that pattern. So you're now testing reaction time, where before it was random to them because they didn't know what to expect, but your, your little testing sequence you do always does up, right, down, down, you know, something like that. So now that they know the second time they come in, it goes up, right, down, down. The third time they come in, they really remember it goes up, right, down, down, that type of thing, okay? So the repetition on the same test um, may also be a threat to the internal validity. So if you're looking at how maybe some supplement or something increases your reaction speed times, well, the fact that they're learning the test versus the actual supplement might be the issue, okay? Instrumentation, negative effects of reliability problems with equipment or observers, right? So. Again, um, you know, one of the issues is, is like if you're doing 40 times and you've got a stopwatch, right? Um, the fact that I may not be able to pick up when somebody starts very good, you know, like maybe I see somebody's hand start to swing and they already get a little bit of a head start before I actually hit the button. Maybe um, when somebody's crossing the line, I'm looking for when their chest crossed, but maybe somebody else, their feet crossed first, you know, things like that, right? So again, you wanna have proper instrumentation so that, um, you know, like if you have some type of video equipment or sensor equipment that detects when somebody starts and stops, that's gonna have better internal validity than somebody's eyewitness of watching them start and stop, okay? Um, again, if the instruments that you have are having a problem, right so you have something that has trouble detecting heart rate or something like that like on some people it works well some people it doesn't that's going to have an issue um statistical regression tendency of extreme scores to regress toward the mean upon retest highest scores get lower and low scores get higher right so as people test and retest and things like that um you know you, you may have had it all nice and scattered out the first time and then all of a sudden everything starts to you know move towards something you know they start to move towards the middle so um you may have somebody that um you know they sort of start getting like oh they're looking for this right they get in their head oh okay this is coming is looking for this sometimes it sort of gets in their mind that and then not only does it get in their mind that this is what the experimenters are looking for they start to perform for what the experimenters are looking for rather than doing what they normally would do, okay? Um, and so that can become a problem. Um, selection bias, comparison groups are not equal at the beginning of the study, right? So this is, this would be like if I'm doing a basketball skills, you know, like I'm, I'm looking at, okay, does this training help versus this training? And so I have one group of folks that are doing basketball skills that are all you know, it's like I, I go and get all these guys from the Miami Heat, and then the other group I get is like the JV basketball team from a local high school, and I don't mix those groups up. I just have the, the professional team, the JV team, you know, in different groups, and I see what happens. Right? That's going to have selection bias. Okay. Experimental mortality loss of participants from the study for any reason. Doesn't mean they had to die, right? That can be one reason. Um, maybe people had time during the first month and it's a three month study and then their work ch shift changes and then they can't come and finish the rest of the, the study, right? Um, or they just, people get tired of doing the study and they decide I'm not going to participate in it, right? It's too hard or it's too time consuming for whatever reason. Um, selection maturation interaction. Maturation affects groups within the study differently, right? Um, so again, you may have people working in groups and, and so they, you know, um, sometimes you may have a group that somehow has a strong leader and it, you know, all of a sudden that group, you know, starts working well together or something, you know, 
versus another group that's more independent and, and things like that. And so the way they started, um, you know, again, they're, maybe they're on different uh, drug therapies or um, supplement therapies or something, but because of something going on within the group, um, you know, there's a dynamics that's happening, some type of like social dynamic that is actually changing what you're seeing, not that, not the actual drug or supplement itself okay um expectancy greater expect expectations influence the data um so again this could be anything from you know like you're you're looking to see if some supplement works better than another supplement and you really want that supplement to work so when you again this is why double blind experiments are really important because sometimes you know, if the experimenter knows that these people are on supplement A and these people are on supplement B and they're really pulling for supplement A, when supplement A folks come in, they're like, hey, good job, good job, good job. You know, and they're really pumping them up to them, you know, to keep going, keep going. And the other group comes in, they're like, hey, good job, buddy. Yeah, good work, keep going. You know, that can have a big influence on how those groups perform, right? Again, check your understanding. Um, so threats to external validity, interaction, effective testing, the pretest changes the group's response to the experimental treatment. Um, you know, again, they start to either figure things out, they, you know, you know they, uh, they change what they're doing from social objectives to have effect, interaction of selection bias and experimental treatment. A biased sample produces skewed results doesn't represent the population. Again, we take one group that's all athletic and one group that's non-athletic or something along those lines. We take a group, you know, if we're doing a weight loss study and we're like, okay, we want to look at this diet versus this diet, and we're really pulling for diet A. So we get all the folks that are obese and put them in diet A. We get all these athletic folks that really can't lose much weight to begin with the body fat and put them in diet B. You know, and we put them through a workout. Well, these guys don't see much change. These guys do, right? Um, reactive effects of experimental settings. Some element of the setting causes modifications of participant behavior, right? So, um, you know, they, you, again, it's a learning thing. They learn like, okay, well, um, they're at this time is when they're going to crank up the, um, you know, they're going to crank up the resistance. So four minutes in is when they really crank up the resistance. So maybe they try to conserve their energy during the easier stages of something, right? So again, you tell somebody, hey, I want you to go as hard as you can until you can't go anymore. And once your RPMs on the bike get below this, we're going to stop it, right? So, you know, the first time in, they're going as hard as they can. Their RPMs are up in the hundreds, you know, and we tell them that as long as they, you know, like stay above 70, they're okay, right? Well, then the second time, like, you know, you killed them on minute four, and that's when they ended up having to stop. So then the next time they come in, instead of like going as fast as they can, and they're pumping out 140 on the RPMs, they come in and they're like, all right, I'm going to stay at 80. So I'm above the 70 mark and they're conserving energy, right? So those things can happen. And then multiple, multiple treatment interference, experiencing one treatment affects participant response to subsequent treatment, right? So again, you may have groups that take one treatment and then halfway through they switch to the other treatment. And then another group switches, right? Well, the thing is, is some treatments, even though they get off, might have had an effect on weight loss. It might have had an effect on muscle building. It might have, you know, so even though they got off of it, um, that effect is still going, right? And so, um, you know, it may skew what you see with the, the other um, treatment that they're on. Um, experimental research design. So pre-experimental designs. Um, again, you may have weak designs, no random assignment of participants to the group. So again, the design in itself um, can be bad. You know, you're like, okay, I want you to do keto. I want you to do low fat, right? Um, so how are we going to control? Nothing. I, I, I just want you to do it on your own, right? And again, so you send your Okay. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, but you didn't give them any parameters to stick to. 
Okay, or you give them like, hey, I'm going to give a group uh, uh, protein, another group. Um, they don't go home with protein. All right, how much should I take? I don't know. Right, you know, I just, it's a bad design. Okay, no random assignment of participants to groups. So, you know, you have a, you know, like a group of friends that all, you know, like say you're looking for 10 people. You've got five friends that all come in that are highly athletic. They're the first five in, put them in one group. The other five that come in are non-athletic and they go into group B. They're very different groups, right? Or you have a group of guys and a group of girls. You have a group of people that are short and a group of people that are tall, whatever, you know. Those are, that's poor assignment to the groups, right? Um, you don't control for threats to the validity, right? Again, you send people out. Um, and you don't give good instruction, you don't hold them accountable, things like that. Um, those can all be issues, right? And sometimes used due to practical constraints, right? Um, sometimes there are certain things that you can't constrain for. I mean, there are certain things you can control for, some things you can ask them to control for, and then there are some things you just can't control for, right? Um, so there's one-shot studies, one group pretest, post-test studies, and statistical group comparison studies, all right? So we'll go through all those, right? Um, experimental research designs, there's true experimental designs. They require random assignment of participants to groups, control many threats to the internal validity. So you, anything that you can think of and that you can also control, you can know. Um, including history, maturation, testing, statistical regression, selection bias, selection, maturation, and testing. So this is everything from having written instructions of what all the experimenters are going to do, written instructions of what all the participants are going to do. Um, also, you know, having where the folks that interact, you know, the researchers that interact with the participants don't know what groups those people are. So they don't know if they're getting a placebo versus an actual supplement um so on and so forth so you know they you know the, the folks the uh the participants are blind to what they're getting as well as the experimenters are blind to what they're getting all right so again here's true experimental designs again so this shows you um you know post-test only pre-test only um solomon four group pre-test post-test groupings um So again, um, this shows you that post-tests only, um, where there's threats and not threats, um, pre-test only groups, only four tests. Um, you know, and again, controlling threats, you know, again, it just, you do your best, right? So you control for those things. All right, so quasi-experiment designs are designed to optimize external validity. Use when circumstances prevent random assignment of participants to groups, right? So again, sometimes um, you won't be able to always randomly assign, okay? So you can do time series, you can do equivalent time samples, non-equivalent control groups, and ex post facto groups. Again, we'll go into these in some of our later chapters, so we're not going to spend a lot of time going through those on this one today. All right. But again, it's you know the time series is that, you know here's day one, day two, day three, best day four, day five, day six. You know, equivalent sample time. Day one, day two test. Day three, day four test. Day five, day six. Um, Non-equivalent groups. Um, day one through two groups and test day two, so on and so forth, right? Um, all right, so again, shorter chapter. Um, a lot of the stuff we kind of flew through on this because we are going to go through this again in more detail. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here and then go over it again. All right, so we'll, we'll get the, we'll hit more into the quasi-experiment versus true experiment, how to do um, blind and double blind and, and those type of things. Um, but again, if you guys have questions, please 
um, feel free to text and email me um, or also write on the blackboard and I'll get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, that's it.